Welcome, everyone. My name is Lisa Cuevas Shaw. I'm the Managing Director for the Center for Open Science. And I have the pleasure of welcoming you to the Year of Open Science Culminating Conference. We have been eagerly anticipating this event after weeks and months of planning and coordinating the program design and development with a range of speakers and the supporting organizations who signed on to endorse and participate in the Year of Open Science. We have nearly 1,300 folks registered for the event, and they represent a wide range of research stakeholders, funding agencies, international government organizations, academic institutions, research organizations, researchers, research staff. This is an opportunity to showcase the outcomes, coalition building, and ongoing work stemming from the 2023 Year of Open Science. I encourage you to join as many sessions as you can. We designed the program so that you all could have access to a range of topics across research infrastructure, community building, policy, rewards and incentives, and everything in between. We intentionally aimed to be as inclusive as a two-day program could afford us the opportunity to do so that you can experience the breadth of open science activities that are happening and the issues, opportunities, and challenges surrounding these various um, efforts. So without further ado, let's get our opening plenary underway. I will be moderating today's opening session with Allison Parker, Senior Program Associate from the Wilson Center. Today's panel features leaders of reform across UNESCO, OSTP, and NASA to share highlights of initiatives and achievements realized during the Year of Open Science, and really to foster discussion about ongoing opportunities and challenges in the global coordination of science reform. So today you're going to hear from Anna Piersik. She is Program Scientist at UNESCO. You'll also hear from Miriam Zeringhalam at uh, OSTP. She's the Assistant Director for Public Access and Research for uh, the Office of Science and Technology Policy. And Shell Gentiman, Program Scientist for uh, the Office of the Chief Science Data Officer. A little bit about um, the representation of this speaker group is just uh, that was done by design. We wanted to hear and, and have kind of a global and international perspective. Uh, this conference is certainly very much situated in the U.S. federal policy landscape as well. And so having the opportunity to hear from Miriam with interagency perspectives is important. And then also having um, the opportunity to hear from Shell and, and NASA, a specific agency that has been really at the forefront of this movement. And um, we, we wouldn't be here today actually without the NASA transform to open science program um, support. So just about the session itself, each presenter was asked to share what their organization set out to do or achieve during the year of open science, what challenges and opportunities they saw or continue to see with these initiatives and the ongoing work, and then what they're continuing to invest in going forward. The presentations will comprise about the first 30 minutes, and then we'll move into a moderated uh, question and answer led by Allison. We also want to privilege audience questions, so feel free to drop those into the Q&A section in Zoom events here. And following the moderated panel session, we'll have time to take questions from the audience. Um, so as you have them, drop them into that Q&A section, and we'll get to them as best as we can. So let me turn it over to our first speaker, Anna Piersik, who has been central to UNESCO's efforts along with her colleagues, Tiffany Straza and others. Anna will kick things off and share what has happened and where to next within UNESCO's efforts to accelerate the global adoption of open science. So take it away, Anna. Great, thank you so much, Lisa, and many thanks for the invitation. Uh, to this event. Um, it's it's really amazing to see so many people gathered here. I'm looking through the participants list and I see a lot of familiar names and a lot of names that I don't know, which is both great. Uh, so thank you so much for having me here. And I'll be very pleased to share with you a little bit what has happened, maybe not exactly in the past year, but a little bit more. Adoption actually of the UNESCO recommendation on open science at the end of 2021. So um, let me share 
my PowerPoint presentation. I hope that you can all um, see it. So, so before I get into what has been done and where we have some challenges and what where we think of what we think of doing next, I just wanted to remind everybody a little bit why open science is an issue and why we are working on open science in UNESCO at the level of the United Nations. Well, first, because science is a human right. Everyone has the right to freely share in scientific advancement and its benefits. And this is something that is written in the Article 27 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So open science, in our view, really is a perfect tool to be able to advance this human right, science as a human right. Secondly, there is the United Nations Agenda for Sustainable Development with 17 Sustainable Development Goals which basically set up all the different challenges that we have uh, in the world today. And we do realize to be able to achieve these SDGs and to be able in general to overcome global challenges, but also local challenges, we need an efficient, equitable, transparent, collaborative, inclusive science, which can also lead to innovative and sustainable solutions. So having science isolated from uh, from society in a way will not help us with innovative solutions which are necessary today to be able to overcome all of these different challenges that we are facing. And talking about this connection to society, which for us is actually the main part, one of the main parts of open science, is because we see and we live in a world where there's a lot of disinformation, misinformation, and to build trust in science and to increase the use of science in decision and policy making, and also to fight disinformation and misinformation, we need science that is more participative, more connected to societal needs, and more accessible to all. So not just in terms of scientific publications that are more accessible to the audience, it's also about scientific processes being more transparent and more accessible to citizens more broadly. So, at the level of UNESCO, uh, what happened is that member states really kind of understood that there is absolute need for a kind of a policy framework at the international level, because open science was kind of starting to, um, to pick up in different countries, in different disciplines, but there was no international policy or action framework. There was no definition, common definition of open science. There were no principles, there were no action at the international level to kind of guide and provide the norms for open science. So after some two years of consultations, at the end of 2021, 193 member states uh, of UNESCO at the time adopted this normative instrument, the first international standard setting instrument on open science, in form of a UNESCO recommendation on open science. And since then, the United States also rejoined UNESCO. So also by rejoining UNESCO, adopted the um, open science recommendation um, of UNESCO. So what the recommendation does is that it provides a common definition. And as you will see, and you know probably not go into details, it goes way beyond open access to scientific data or scientific publications. It also kind of includes the whole part of infrastructures, engagement with societal actors, and goes all the way to kind of building the dialogue with other knowledge systems. All again, in this view of building the knowledge that is necessary to um, provide solutions to common challenges and also to provide uh, benefits and well-being for uh, the humanity as a whole. Important part is also that the recommendation also kind of brought up uh, the different values and principles of open science. We talk about diversity, inclusiveness, quality, collective benefit, fairness, and equity. So kind of situating science in the realm of public good in line with this right um, to science as a human right. And then also the recommendation spells out a, a variety of different actions that need to be taken at different levels and by different actors of open science. So looking at some of the key achievements since the adoption of the recommendation, and many of them actually did coincide with the 2023 year of open science, I think as a first thing, we see that the open science community more broadly, both at the science level all the way to decision makers, have really um, embraced recommendation 
uh, that has this more holistic view of open science. It has also embraced the recommendation because uh, I think everybody agrees in the open science community that to have open science that really works and reaches its potential, it has to be global, it has to be equitable, it has to be accessible really for all, independently of where you are or what discipline um, uh, you are looking at. Uh, we've also developed a series of, of standards, toolkits, uh, checklists to help both member states and um, various audiences to understand better the recommendation and what the different parts of the recommendations are, and also to use it to be able to um, advance their actions in open science. We produce the open science outlook, and I will talk about it a little bit later. We've also seen a very positive impact on policy development. And I will here focus on national policies that we've seen developed since the adoption of the recommendation. But of course, there is a series of different institutional policies on open science, which have also been in place and been put in place in different countries to strengthen the work towards open science. So we know that 11, at least 11 countries have adopted more holistic open science policies or policy instruments. And when I say more holistic, it's policies that go beyond open access or go beyond open data and that kind of have um, a more holistic view of the different elements of open science, including these parts in particular on engagement of society. Uh, we have seen a boom of policy development in terms of open science um, in African countries. Before the recommendation, there were just several of them who had some kind of policy instruments on uh, open access. But since the recommendation was, uh, was adopted, we have different countries in Africa, 10 at least, probably even more, that are working on open science policies or strategies or roadmaps um, or, or other policy instruments. We have several countries that have actually opened up their national science technology innovation policies and included the principles of open science into those policies. And we see that as a major achievement because that actually tells us that those countries see open science as science for their countries. So as we were saying all along, there is no open science and science eventually all science should become open science and follow the principles of open science. And we have a series of regional bodies that are trying also, particularly in Africa, that are trying to develop their strategies for open science, because countries have seen that because open science is open by definition and is prone to sharing and collaboration, having a strategy at regional level, so among the different countries in the same region, is actually very beneficial because they can then also benefit from some synergies and from collaboration that can happen more easily if they have a common strategy on open science. And then we've also worked to expand our partnerships and also our um, different experts that are working with us. What we have seen as a key challenge is really a shift to open science is actually a shift a, a shift in a culture of science. You cannot only work on open access or only work on open data. You really do have to kind of have a holistic view at, at the entire science system and kind of start doing things in different parts. So you need infrastructures, you need capacities, you need incentives, you need policies, you need funding, and you also need monitoring. So you need practical actions and also cultural shifts to be able to really transition towards open science. We've also seen that there is absolute need for equitable collaborations. And I will keep talking about that throughout my presentation and in the interventions during this uh, next few days, because it really is central to open science. Equitable co collaborations, uh, equity in general is really key for open science to fully reach its potential. And then monitoring. Monitoring is extremely important. We see it because there are some there are some initiatives that are put in place which actually have positive impacts and then some that may have some unintended consequences and we need to be able to monitor open science and its practices to make sure that we adjust constantly and make sure that we are going in the right direction. So a monitoring effort that we've tried is by providing and, and filling, um, compiling this open science outlook. It's the first way that um, 
at the global scale, we looked into the different pillars of open science as uh, it is defined in the recommendation and where we kind of stand in different um, in different regions and different parts of the world. And we see more in general that open science practices really are on the rise. However, access to participation and benefit from open science are still very uneven across the world. And we see the gaps that persist ex um, along the existing socioeconomic, technological and digi digital divides. And there is really lack of equity in access to funding, skills and different tools, uh, which really do prevent open science from reaching its full potential. And again, I wanna stress the importance of collective collaborative and coordinated action and investment to accelerate this transition towards a real global and equitable open science. Another set of conclusions that we came uh, came with from the, the development of the outlook is that we don't really have a good monitoring system for open science. We do not really know how to measure um, impacts of open science, how to measure open science more broadly. Uh, we do not have a way of measuring open science in terms of its values. We can measure in terms of some of the outputs, but that really is not enough. And that is not going to give us an idea of um, if the system is moving in the right direction. So counting is not enough. The current system of rankings do not promote inclusion, equity, and openness. And really, open science gives us the opportunity to think out of the box, to think differently, to strengthen the focus on values and on people who are doing science and not just the products of science. So there really is need to look into monitoring, look into innovation with, uh, with regards to the different indicators, both qualitative and quantitative, and find another way for us to assess um, open science and monitor open science. So in terms of what our priorities are for next year and for the years to come, uh, next this year in particular for us is very important because the member states that have adopted the recommendation now have to provide surveys, have to monitor the implementation of the recommendation. And so throughout 2024, we will be helping countries in gathering information to provide us with reports at the beginning of next year on their status of implementation of um, the recommendation. And I think that is going to give us a lot of new information with regards to best practices, good practices, attempts, failures, and challenges that countries encounter in um, transitioning to open science. We'll continue to work on a global monitoring framework for open science, on policy support, development of different resources, and also we will be gathering different actors, and I do invite you to follow um, to follow us and join us in the different international gatherings that we will be um, organizing towards uh, this year and then also in the beginning of next year. So with this, I will thank you and I will, I'm very much looking forward to the questions um, and the discussion. Thank you very much. I think I will pass the floor to Mariam now. Mariam, you have the floor, please. Great, thank you so much. All right. Um, well, I am the uh, Assistant Director for Public Access and Research Policy at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, or OSTP. And for those of you who may not be familiar, OSTP's mission includes providing science and technology advice to the Executive Office of the President, and working with our federal partners and Congress to create bold visions, wise policies, and effective, equitable programs for science and technology. Now, my work at OSTP centers on advancing the Biden-Harris administration's commitment to providing public access to data, publications, and the other important products of the nation's taxpayer-supported research and innovation enterprise. If you'll go to the next slide, please. And I'd like to ground my remarks, um, as I often do, in our U.S. government-wide definition for open science, which was unveiled in January of 2023 to kick off the 2023 year of open science. And this definition was developed through the National Science and Technology Council's Subcommittee on Open Science, which is made up of representatives from research from agencies across the uh, U.S. government who put their heads together to develop this definition. Um, 
And we have collectively defined open science as the principle and practice of making research products and processes available to all while respecting diverse cultures, maintaining security and privacy, and fostering collaborations, reproducibility, and equity. Now, this definition, uh, while it is a sentence, is doing a whole lot of work bringing together a number of the administration's priorities around advancing a vision for science and for research more broadly. So it leads with this commitment to enhancing access to the products and processes of research, which is pretty standard to all of the definitions of open science that we've come across. It's inclusive, noting that these outputs must be made equitably available to all, whether they are researchers, students, policymakers, community advocates, professors, small business owners, or members, other members of the broader public. The definition also notes the need for members of this open science enterprise to respect diverse cultures in their pursuit, instilling this sense of curiosity and humility. Uh, it also reinforces the need for considerations around security and privacy when making decisions around what can and should be shared broadly. And it ends by looking towards desired outcomes of open science, namely opening up more opportunities for collaborations with diverse communities across all of society, enhancing reproducibility by increasing access to the data and tools underlying research findings, and supporting equitable access to those findings as well as outcomes based on them. Now, if we look to this administration's aspirations, from curbing greenhouse gas emissions to reducing social inequalities to ending cancer as we know it, all while driving equitable outcomes for all across our nation, bolstering public trust and strengthening our decision-making capacity. These are really complex and multifaceted challenges that require a diverse and collaborative knowledge base. And so advancing open science policies and practices is really critical to realizing these aspirations and delivering on our commitments to ensuring that all of America can participate in, contribute to, and benefit from science and technology. Next slide. So with all of that said, realizing the potential for open science requires considerations of, of all sorts, including around infrastructure, research culture, incentive structures, responsible communications, funding opportunities, community outreach and engagement, and more. And so in January of 2023, OSTP launched the Year of Open Science with a slate of commitments and activities across the government to advance a more open science ecosystem. 17 federal agencies and departments officially signed on to join the Year of Open Science, coordinating our efforts through that interagency body of the Subcommittee on Open Science. And more agencies um, joined these conversations around advancing this culture of open science um, beyond just those 17. Next slide. So you can learn more about a number of projects initiated or strengthened over the course of 2023 across the government on open.science.gov. But I'd like to highlight a few of these activities in the time that we have together. So we've organized the, the efforts that happened in the year of open science into five overarching themes. Policy developments to advance the practice of open science, infrastructure developments or enhancements to enable uh, that access is in a manner that is equitable and secure, opportunities for training and capacity development to promote a workforce that can contribute to and advance open research, opportunities for community engagement to broad, broaden participation in open science, and promoting incentives for advancing open research practices so that this important work is recognized and rewarded. Next slide. So the 2023 Year of Open Science came on the heels of OSTP's uh, August 2022 memorandum titled Ensuring Free, Immediate, and Equitable Access to Federally Funded Research. The memo builds on and strengthens public access guidance issued by OSTP in 2013. And the driving principle motivating the updated policy is summed up in the memo itself, where, uh, where we write that American investment in such research is essential to the health, economic prosperity, and well being of the nation. There should be no delay between taxpayers and the returns on their investment in research. And so, since the memo was issued, 
Uh, we've been hard at work across the U.S. government coordinating and collaborating with our agency partners around implementation of this memo. Many agencies have publicly posted their plans for updating their public access policies, which you can find all in one place on science.gov. Next slide. Robust, accessible, and secure infrastructures are incredibly important for ensuring that the research products that we're seeking to make publicly available can actually be discovered, accessed, and used by diverse end-user communities. Of course, agencies have a long-standing commitment to developing, support, supporting, and strengthening these infrastructures that predates the year of open science. But still, there were some really notable efforts that were launched in that in the last year, including the Department of Energy's persistent identifiers at OSTI resource, which is a really convenient one-stop shop for researchers and agencies to learn more about the persistent identifier services that they provide, as well as to better understand persistent identifiers more generally. The National Science Foundation also invested $12.5 million into their findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable Open Science Research Coordination Networks, or FAROS RCN program. The cohort of 10 three-year multi-institutional projects kicked off in 2023 to build and enhance national coordination among the research community, including around things like standards development, big data infrastructures, data system connection, educational opportunities, and other pathways for collaboration. Next slide. So accessing using and responsibly contributing to openly available research outputs also requires open science skill building. And so to this end, in December, and really throughout 2023, NASA was hard at work uh, through their Transform to Open Science program, developing their Open Science 101 curriculum, which was released in December of last year. And I'm sure that you will hear more about this um, in just a moment. Uh, but I will say from where I sit, it's been really wonderful seeing communities of practice sprout up within the government and beyond taking this training, discussing what they're learning and putting those learnings into action. 2023 also saw tremendous developments in the National Institute for Standards and Technologies efforts to develop the NIST research data framework, which is a comprehensive resource that maps the research data landscape and provides a dynamic guide for various communities to understand best practices, costs, and benefits for research data management and dissemination. And this framework was developed through really extensive community engagement, including a request for information issued last year and a workshop hosted at the National Academies in September. And that input was worked into version 2.0 of the framework, which was released earlier this year. Next slide. So for our policies and practices to really benefit all, engagement had to be central, a central theme for the year. Not only engaging with those who have long been members and participating in the open science community, but also engaging with communities who may be newer to the open science space. And so these activities included continuing longstanding programs like the U.S. Geological Survey's Community for Data Integration, which is a community of practice working to grow knowledge in scientific information management and integration, as well as understanding the needs of those who will, uh, who will become uh, more active in the open science space. So over the summer of 2023, OSTP hosted a series of listening sessions on advancing a future of open science with, early, with the early career researcher community. And you can learn more about some of the key themes and outcomes um, that emerged from those sessions in this readout um, of, of those four listening sessions that's posted on OSTP's website. Next slide. So advancing adoption of open science, of course, requires that we recognize and reward those who are leading the way. So in addition to creating funding opportunities and investments in the various activities I touched on earlier, we've thought about how to spotlight the stories and teams that have been leading the way in open science for quite some time. So in September of last year, OSTP launched the uh, Year of Open Science Recognition Challenge, partnering with a number of agencies to promote the challenge and to judge the uh, submissions that we received. We invited researchers, community scientists, educators, innovators, and other members of the broader public to share stories of how they've advanced uh, equitable open science. Next slide. 
And I'm very excited to share with you all that this morning, we've announced five project submissions as champions of open science in five categories. These are teams and projects that have used the power of open science to work with local communities to address their needs, to promote educational opportunities for all across our nation, to advance solutions to global challenges, to engage new and diverse audiences to drive discovery and innovation, and promote the infrastructures and tools that enable open science to move forward. While I don't have time to tell you about these five really wonderful projects, you can learn more about them in a press release that we issued this morning. And we hope that by highlighting the transformative impact of open science on society, that these projects can inspire others to share their stories of open science and to contribute to this movement as the US government continues into from a year of open science into a future for open science and research. So next slide. So this is just a snapshot of what we've done across the government throughout 2023. We're really excited to continue to build on our government-wide commitments to advancing the infrastructures, capacity, and engagement to realize this more open, equitable, and secure research enterprise as we move from 2023 and into this future for open science. And so with that, I thank you for your attention, and I will pass it over to my colleague, um, Shell Gentiman from NASA, uh, who will be taking the stage. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and thank you. I'm here from NASA to talk about the open road ahead. I'm an IPA, and I sit at the Office of the Chief Science Data Officer at NASA. And I'm really excited to see all of the work being done across the federal agencies. In 2024, NASA is working to make the impossible possible. And inspired by President John F. Kennedy and Ayana Elizabeth Johnson and Katherine Wilkinson's book, All We Can Save, there are space telescopes that peer into the farthest reaches of space to new lunar missions. And none of this is possible without teamwork, which is why improving how we work together is essential to advancing science and technology. And this is why we are choosing to rapidly advance the adoption of open science. We are asking scientists to change, not because it is easy, but because it is hard. Because this goal, making science open, will benefit humanity, will benefit science, and will lead to new discoveries. Because this challenge is one we're willing to accept, one we're unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win because science, science is for everyone. And we need every solution and every solver. And as the saying goes, to change everything, we need everyone. And what this moment calls for is a mosaic of voices, the full spectrum of ideas and insights for how we can turn things around. At NASA, we are working to we're joining with 16 other federal agencies for the year of open science. And NASA also has designated 2023 as a year of open science. Throughout this year, we worked to energize and uplift open science across the community. So what did we really accomplish? Uh, the link to my talk is going to be put into chat, I believe, because it's filled with different links about what we've done. Our strategy to advance open science, it had four core areas of focus, increasing visibility, creating new resources, working to change the incentives to align with our values, and really starting to change the ecosystem that we all do science in. We worked on articles and announcements. We had an open science video. We had open science on the NASA website. We had a number of different articles published in all different types of publications. We also worked with global experts to develop an NASA's introduction to open science, which has best practices, tools, and practical skills for anyone who wants to learn how to do open science. 
It's called Open Science 101. And you can complete that online independently, but there's also summer schools and cohorts that were online cohorts that we're supporting as well. For incentives, if you complete this introduction to open science, you actually get a NASA open science digital badge. It's linked to your ORCID. It shows up on your LinkedIn or your social media. It shows up on your ORCID profile. And we've been working with the White House, as Miriam just talked about, for high profile prizes and challenges to recognize all of the amazing open science activities that are going on. And we're also supporting open science activities, open science software, data, visualization, tools to do open science at about five and a half million dollars per year. We have a new NASA scientific information policy, SPD41A, which has many requirements that align with open science activities. We're asking that proposals to NASA include an open science and data management plan. And we're having a work, we already had a workshop with university leaders on modernizing evaluation criteria, recognizing that we aren't just doing open science at NASA. We sit within an international, we sit within an academic, all of our partners where science is being done. So we all have to think about how do we advance open science together. I was asked to think about challenges and opportunities and these are some of the things that as I go out into the community, we sort of face and we see every day. And the first is really uh, the culture eats strategy for breakfast and a closed culture of not sharing data, of retaining a competitive advantage or a perceived competitive advantage is really hard to overcome, especially when incentives are not always aligned with values. So as researchers are looking for the rewards, whether it's funding, whether it's career advancement, when those don't recognize open science activities, they don't recognize the value of reproducible and transparent science. It's difficult to ask them to do science in this new way. We also know that as we move towards open science, we need to be very, very careful and strategic and ensure that our designs advance equitable participation in science. We also face this point of view that we hear about a lot that open science is yet another unfunded mandate. And I always try to switch because from my point of view, and up until two years ago when I joined NASA, I was a research scientist on soft money. I did open science because Oh my gosh, look at how faster and better my science is. Look at how many more people I'm collaborating with. Look at how much larger the impact is because there are more people participating. So we try to talk about it's not just a cost, but also there are a lot of benefits. Data is easier to get. Science is more reproducible and it's easier to build on other results. And that makes your science faster. So yes, there are some parts that you'll have to do additional work, but then more people will be able to build on your results and you'll have more visibility. So we try to have that conversation a lot. With opportunities, there is this incredible momentum around open science. It really does feel like the world is changing. And I think that we all should try to lean into that because these opportunities don't come along every day. The partnerships that we're building across the federal agencies uh, internationally and uh, within the United States with academic organizations, I think are all helping to advance open science. And they really offer, you know, maybe also with philanthropic organizations, a way to work together. Uh, there's opportunities, uh, as Anna mentioned, for measuring the impacts and really designing that strategy for what is working, what is not working, when do we need to pivot, how is it advancing equitable participation, and really developing those metrics so that they're not just like our old metrics where they only recognized citations and publications, but recognizing the full breadth of the scientific process. And that goes into recognizing the value of data and code as well. And the new ways that we're all sharing results, it feels like there are so many opportunities to share scientific research online that we really, I would love to see the research community lean into that new way to share results. 
And the global transformation, I think this is a huge opportunity. It's not just an open future, but it's a more equitable open future. At NASA, we have continued investments to enable open science. And each of these activities helps move towards enabling open science for NASA. There are three primary activities within the Office of the Chief Science Data Officer to enable open science. The first is data and compute services, looking to develop core services for scientific discovery. So core data and computing services that recognize how things have really changed with the advent of cloud computing. Next are the data science and AI, so implementing innovative data science tools with a focus on inclusion and expanding the accessibility of scientific information, and the open science implementation, which includes the Transform to Open Science project, the policy development, education incentives, and advocacy. So we're looking across all these different activities, building together to enable open science, to enable breakthroughs. And specifically, I want to call out the awards and the funding. What will NASA fund? These are just some of the areas that NASA funds, but these are ones that have open science applications. And again, there's links in the, in the PDF that has been uploaded to the chat. We fund workshops and conferences, open source tools, frameworks, and libraries, machine learning tools, citizen science, innovative new ways to support open science, and uh, supplements for open science and cloud computing. And I like to ask at every talk that I give and to every community, and many of you are already doing open science, but we all know that there are things that we could be doing better or things that we could be working on to improve. So the future is open. So what's one thing that you can do right now to be more open about your science. And I have one suggestion, which is to take NASA's Open Science 101. If you do so, you get this beautiful gold NASA Open Science badge and it will show up on your LinkedIn and in your social media. You get a certificate from NASA and you can sign up here. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks to all three of you. Thank you, Shell. Thank you, Anna. And thank you, Miriam. Um, first of all, I just want to acknowledge that we just had um, uh, wonderful overviews and, and really rich. It's, it's hard probably to present everything in a 10 minute slot, but just to acknowledge that we also had two announcements here. Right. So we did hear from Anna about uh, the General Assembly's approval of the national survey uh, to begin to, to really monitor um, open science at the national level, which is very, very exciting. Um, and so I'm sure there will be more to come on that, but it sounded as though the reports would be due sometime in, in 2025. Um, so if, if there's time, we can certainly discuss that. But I know that was that was hot off the press in terms of approval. So that's wonderful to hear. And then I love that, uh, Miriam, you announced the uh, Year of Open Science Recognition Challenge winners. So we did drop that press release in the chat for everyone to go take a look at uh, the winners as well. So just to acknowledge those two things, um, we're going to transition into the moderated question and answer, uh, and I will turn it over to my colleague, Allison Parker, to do that. And then I will continue to monitor the Q&A in the chat. And as there's time towards the end of the session, we'll also open it up um, to, to share those questions as well. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, thanks so much to all of our panelists for really your, your presentations and for your um, ability and capacity to be sort of insightful and reflective about this year and what it means for open science um, and, and where we're going. Um, I think we'll continue along those themes and sort of stay pretty high level and ask you to reflect a bit more on what you've learned from the year of open science and sort of what we can bring forward um, as a community. And so I'll start with one question about sort of the messages about open science that ties into, Anna, you mentioned the values and principles of open science, and then Shell, you mentioned the opportunities. So in all of your discussions with um, national and international policymakers, um, what have you found about messages about open science that resonate the most? Like what are the one or two things that people seem to really um, 
here um, and sort of continue the conversation around open science. Uh, I'll I'll call on you so that we don't have any confusion, but let's start with uh, Miriam. Sure. Um, so I think that one thing that that really resonates is that um, I think as as Anna mentioned, this this idea of science is really belonging to everybody. And open science as this opportunity to think about how we approach science so that we are thinking about it, not just, you know, sharing and openness at the end of the research life cycle, but creating opportunities for on ramps and bridges and engagement throughout the research life cycle so that we are really involving communities across the country and the world in this process of doing science and research. And I think when we think about it in that way, as you know, opening up who can participate in this really vital enterprise, um, I think that 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 really resonates with um, at, at least you know thinking about at the policy level and thinking about sort of like broadly who are who are the communities that we are trying to reach and who are the communities that we serve in the U.S. government. It's it's the um, it's you know people within across the, the country. Um, and I think in the in these international contexts really around the world. Good segue to Anna, what do you think? Yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree. We, we, we do see though a, a bit of a difference also in what resonates more with maybe countries in the South and countries in the North. Um, I, I think in the South really the, the the hope is that open science would help in bridging the gaps in science technology innovation, the digital gaps, et cetera, through more equitable science, more access to science, more access to knowledge, et cetera. Um, in the North, I think what resonates maybe a little bit more is to kind of increase the efficiency of science um, and, um, and, and to kind of benefit from complementarities and to kind of avoid the duplication uh, and and in a way it's also the economic benefits that that result from that 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 are also quite interesting to some policymakers. But then when we get to institutional level, it's it's a bit different because it really depends on the institution, on discipline, on it's it's it varies a lot. But I think what people have seen in general for the institution is that diversity, inclusion, equity, equality, this is something that they definitely have to embed in their institution to main to, to have talent, to just, you know, to attract talent, to maintain talent. So that's really something I think that resonates more and more because particularly young people want to join places that are collaborative, that are open, that are transparent, uh, that are more connected to what's happening, that are more dynamic. So um, yeah, really depending on who you kind of talk to, there are different facets um, of the benefits of open science that you can promote more. And, and luckily there are so many that you can really kind of tailor your message to the, to the person you're talking to. Yeah, absolutely, Shell. Uh, I completely agree with what Miriam and Anna just said, and uh, I'm going to go to a different audience, which is the general public, since I think they've covered policymakers and the uh, early career so well. When we talk to the general public, something that really resonates with people is when we talk about cancer and when we talk about COVID. And we can't almost... Every one of us has had someone in their lives with cancer and at some point has gone online to look for clinical trials or to look for cancer research and encountered paywalls and been unable. You see these federally funded studies and this federally funded research and you have someone that you love in jeopardy and you can't help them. And that is something that that inability to access information really resonates as some a real life experience for many people. And then we talk about how during COVID, the paywalls were suspended and the way that research was able to advance more rapidly. And 
it was a direct result of not only a huge federal investment, but also just the access to information. And people remember being able to find that information. And then this experience of seeing and participating and being feeling part of it versus something hidden is a uh, resonates we find a lot with the public. Definitely. That's fascinating. Um, jumping now to barriers and challenges, which you all touched on um, in each of your remarks. Uh, again, asking you to sort of pick one. Uh, what do you see as you know, moving, moving on from the year of open science um, into our, our future of open science, as, as Miriam mentioned? Uh, what do you see as the biggest barrier to implementation or the biggest challenge? And I think this can be sort of a call to action for this community that's gathered today and how can we all sort of coalesce around a few of the, the main barriers that we're seeing um, coming out of this major uh, year of action. Um, so let's start, Michelle, why don't we go back to you this time to um, kick us off and then we'll uh, ask Anna and Miriam from there. I think one of the biggest barriers that we encounter is that the people who have the platforms the people who have the privilege and the people who have the loudest voices who want to protect that privilege are often very vocal about wanting to not advance open science. Uh, and that is something that we see a lot of. And we try to, I think that the, the solution is to really embrace the diverse early career community that are our champions and to elevate their voices and to try and shift some of that privilege to them because they really are the future. And we all can get, there are also amazing advocates who are in positions of power, but sometimes you hear a lot of, oh, it's an unfunded mandate or you're asking this, being able to tell the stories of all of these successes and show the diverse participation in open science is um, the more that we can elevate that, I think what will start to address that, that barrier that we constantly run into, which is power and privilege. Anna? Yes, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, what we see, it really is trying to kind of break the culture of close that we have in the science systems around the world. And that is indeed connected to power and privilege that are connected to that closeness, right? So this kind of democratization of science that has to happen uh, is the biggest opportunity we have, but also the biggest challenge moving forward. Um, and I agree with, with Shell that we need voices. We need to speak up, to make people understand what open science is, what it is not also. I think there's a lot of confusion and some of this confusion is put out there by people who are not, who are reluctant to embrace open science. So they kind of, you know, while people are confused, it's easy then to just sell all kinds of different things. So I think, I think making sure that we are very clear about what we mean by open science, when open is not open, when open uh, can be restricted, what are the rules of the community uh, to guide sharing of data, sharing of knowledge, collaborations, etc. Open science can happen in so many different ways. Um, and, I, and I think and I think we, we kind of have to also start getting out of our open science community into those communities that are not open yet. And even if it's harder to talk to them, it's it's really to, to try to get the messages across these other communities um, as well. So if there is a big conference on climate change, I think open science people have to be in that conference as well. Conference on biodiversity on other things, we have to be there and, and talk about the importance of open practices in their uh, domains. I think that's how we're gonna reach a bigger audience and then maybe have the movement grow uh, even more. Miriam. Um, sure. So I I think kind of building on building on some of the discussion around early career researchers, I'll say that capacity building um, and sort of you know retooling or or having time and space and support to learn how to um, really embrace uh, and meaningfully um, adopt these open science practices is I, I think an opportunity, you know, both an opportunity and a challenge. 
And so that is one of the things that we really heard during the course of our um, listening sessions with the early career researcher community, as well as with communities that support early career researchers, librarians, data curators, and so on. Um, and so I think, you know, finding you know, one of the great things about NASA's Open Science 101 uh, curriculum is that it is openly available, that it is an opportunity to sort of build communities of practice around that. But making sure that that time is also recognized and honored by, you know, people overseeing um, the, the work of early career researchers is, is something that we've heard is really important, that they just need time to, to learn these things. And then there's also been just like really great efforts um, across agencies, including NIH has been sharing um, uh, exemplars are good examples of data management and sharing plans to create opportunities for other researchers in the biomedical research space, kind of learn, you know, how are, how are people approaching this and how are they thinking about data management um, and sharing throughout the research life cycle. The same thing with NIST's research data, uh, research data framework. There are these tools that are becoming available, these resources that are becoming available and making sure that we're giving the time and space for those to be adopted is something that, you know, we have these tools more and more, and, and now it's just like getting them into the hands of people in ways that are meaningful to them. Absolutely. So Lisa, I'll ask one more question and maybe then we can transition to audience questions. So please keep continuing to add those to the Q&A, um, everybody out there. Um, so it's it's clear from at least from my observations about the year of open science um, and all the the activities that have happened that it's really relied on collaboration and coalitions and sort of interagency relationships and relationships between nation states and national governments and this also made me think of Shell's comment about culture um, and how how essential and central that is to um, progressing this movement. Um, so starting with Miriam and then um, Anna and Shell, and please answer for your respective scale. Like for Miriam, it's clear that your interagency relationships are key, whereas Anna thinking more about um, nation states uh, and, and international governments. Um, what have you learned about working um, across agencies, across nations, across different uh, sectors and level of government? Yeah, so I'll I'll say from the um, sort of interagency perspective, we really have benefited from a robust infrastructure of interagency collaboration and coordination for the last decade. Um, so that subcommittee on open science that I had mentioned, which is where we coordinated the year of open science activities, is a group that has existed in in some form for it, for at least the last decade. And so we've really been able to leverage these existing partnerships and collaborations and just relationships between people who have been leading um, in the open science space for quite some time and thinking about sort of what, so we've, you know, even though 2023 was the first year of open science, there's all of these ways that we've been coordinating um, and the year of open science gave us this opportunity to uh, sort of bring, bring more communities into what that coordination looks like. And so it's been really great to have, um, you know, panels or, or conferences like this, where we get to sit on a panel and talk about the ways that we've already been working together on things like infrastructure or adopting best practices around capacity building or best practices around data management and sharing kind of messaging and communication. Um, so it's been, you know, for me coming into this role, just really wonderful to see those, those strong relationships and collaborations, both across agencies and also with the communities um, that we work with um, across the research enterprise, really, um, you know, get to shine a spotlight on, on those, um, on those, you know, bonds uh, over the years. Anna, do you want to? Jump in. Yeah, I think um, even from kind of the international perspective, I think uh, what is important to have these platforms for dialogue, where where in in our 
um, in our case, countries can talk to uh, each other and, and, you know, talk about the challenges, but talk also about opportunities, look into pot potential matchmakings or something like that. So I think providing these platforms and these fora, whether it's intergovernmental like at UNESCO or it is at international uh, conferences, I think it's it, it really is important. And, and, and I hope we're going to have much more of that going forward. But also what we've seen is, again, at the international level, is to, the need to rethink a little bit scientific collaborations across nations. Uh, so there has been a, a, a lot of asymmetries in how these collaborations happen. There has been a lot of somebody has something and they just go give it to the other one, whether that other one wants it or not in a way. Uh, and to the extent, not always very equitable. So I think we also have to seriously rethink what STI, uh, science, technology, innovation collaborations at the international level in the open, open science context mean, uh, and then start to implement them in that way. And how do we make them more equitable and more learning and exchanges from all sides and all ends, particularly when it comes to open science, um, different countries have different perspectives and different things that can bring into a partnership, into a collaboration. And I think we have to really uh, make sure that these, these, these partnerships and collaborations really work um, and, and, and are equitable as, they're, as they should be. So something to think about. We will be um, organizing a meeting uh, in December in South Africa to look into this equity in partnerships a little bit. So I will uh, invite all of you to join as well, because I think we need some new principles, just thinking about how this partnership should actually look like uh, today in the open science context. Shell, are there things you'd like to add? Yeah, just to add that one of the roles that we've played at NASA is we're working with all these, uh, you know, other federal agencies and, and uh, is we've really seen part of our role as being able to recognize and elevate the work that's been done by open science advocates over the last couple of decades. We've had, and to provide that, uh, this sort of a channel uh, of their lessons learned, their feedback to uh, federal agencies just as uh, a conversation. And we've had that also. So we've had a community panel with representatives from open science organizations and open science projects that have really been doing this for a long time. So that as we are moving into this field, we really make sure to uh, include them, recognize them, and also learn from them. And we're also working with academic institutions so that we don't want this to be a top-down initiative because it really is a bottoms-up initiative. And so as federal agencies and large international groups and governments start having more policies around open science, we want to make sure that there's that channel for the conversation of the people who are on the ground, the people who are doing the research, and the organizations that have been active in this area, especially around elevating researchers from underserved communities have a voice. Thank you. So Lisa, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. I see there's been a lot of great questions. <laughs> a lot of activity. Thank you. Thank you for those responses and, and the thoughtful questions as well, Allison. I'm going to start with two um, kind of directed or specific questions that are in the, the Q&A section and then pull out to a couple of broader ones. And then we will end at about um, 20 minutes or so after the hour. So um, this will go fast. But the first question is from Ivy Christensen, and it's for Shell specifically. So Ivy says that um, as a member of the aerospace community, I'd love to know how the private aerospace industry can better embrace open science principles with the balance of ITAR restrictions. And the reason I ask this question is a very pointed and specific question, but there's a lot, a lot of threads around public and private industry and the exchange there, some of the, the natural things you can think of in terms of IP rewards, incentives for remaining closed, right, or other issues. And so I wonder if you could touch on that, maybe also just maybe what you're seeing in terms of private uh, industry. 
I want to be very, very clear that we do not want anyone sharing ITAR restricted information and saying that it's an open science. Open science is also about security and security for both ITAR, for personal information, for health information, for any sort of sensitive information. Openness, and this is part of what we spend uh, in the open science, the introduction to open science. We actually spend quite a bit of time talking about this because openness has to be thoughtful and openness has to be intentional. So if there are security restrictions, please do not share that information. If there are sensitive personal information, you know, around healthcare, please do not share that information. There's ways to anonymize that data set. So when we ask people to be open, it's with those caveats. We want it to be secure. Uh, and we get this question a lot around IP. Um, you know, you can, you can patent your ideas and that is one way to control how you share it. Uh, we encourage people to think about the trade-offs between being closed and being open. So there are certainly some things that people will want to keep closed for a competitive edge, but for federally funded research, for taxpayer dollars that is going towards research, we want those to be open because we value the advancing of science. We value the breakthrough discoveries that are going to come from that. And we want federally funded research to be open. And Miriam might have uh, more to say on this, I would think. Um, sure, I can just I can just chime in and say that um, you know I think for for a long time there's been this paradigm of you know openness and security as being an opposition, but we see them as going hand in hand. That if you want um, that open science is responsible science is secure science, and so you know part of the motivations for our requirements around data management and sharing, for example, is that you should be thinking about these decisions, these important security, ethical considerations at the start of your research project before you go into generating data and really think collaboratively about like what are what are the best ways that we can share this information or not share. And so thinking about it on a spectrum, um, I think is much more, meaningful and responsible um, and intentional way of doing research. Um, so, yes. Thank you. Thanks, Shell. Thanks, Miriam. And I know I, I won't speak on your behalf, Anna, but I know obviously the recommendation on open science repeats um, several times as open as possible, as closed as necessary, right? And so it's it's finding, you know, the, the symbiotic relationship and, and being responsible with that. So thank you. A question from Sarah Whalen um, at Wiley, and this is for you, Miriam. Um, will OSTP release any additional guidance um, this coming year to help agencies navigate some of the more difficult topics and, and kind of questions related to the Nelson memo implementation? So data management, reasonable costs, um, any agency communication plans to external audiences? So I know there's been a lot of follow-up, obviously, and you mentioned agencies are releasing, you know, requests for information and really putting those implementation plans together. What can we expect in terms of additional guidance, if any? So since the release of the 2022 public access memo, we have been working really, really closely with all of the agency public access leads. Um, leading up to their submission of their updated public access plans, some of which has been publicly posted, have gone out for public comment, um, have been kind of engaged in listening tours across their agencies, um, and so on, since, since August of 2022. Um, and really, even before then, we've long been working together around implementation of the 2013 public access memo, and that 2022 memo is a continuation and strengthening of that. And so we have been um, having sort of regular community of practice style meetings very, uh, very often. Um, I, I think now it's twice a month with agency public access leads and people responsible for implementation to exchange best practices, lessons learned, different approaches to, um, to the expectations of that 2022 memo. There's also been really wonderful work that's been supported by agencies. So for example, 
um, the National Science Foundation had um, had uh, sponsored some work around um, uh, for the Association for Research Libraries to look at sort of costs around data management and sharing. And that work is now being supported by um, the Institute for Museum uh, and Library Services, IMLS. Um, there's to kind of get at some of these um, these other considerations and a lot of discussion um, about the learnings and the the processes that are um, being sort of uncovered through those studies. So um, a lot of coordination and, and really hands-on engagement, both with OSTP2 agencies and across agencies and, and sort of mentorship or um, sharing of best practices relationships. That's great. Super helpful. Thank you for those insights. Okay, I'm going to pull back a little bit and and um, from Hillary Connolly. So she writes, uh, the stage setting has been so useful and also a bit like drinking from a fire hose in the best way, of course. Um, from a research institution perspective and practicing researcher, where does one start? And I think this kind of speaks a little bit, Miriam, you mentioned the significant, uh, the importance of capacity building, um, right? And, and so um, making sure that we're creating the, the space and the time and, and offering the resources. But for, for any of you, uh, where, you know, if you're a little overwhelmed of where to begin and situated in research institution and or practicing researcher, what advice would you offer in terms of where to begin? I'll jump in because especially if you're at a research institution, I think all of our best friends are the friendly librarians. They're often extremely knowledgeable about these areas and these activities and can give you, connect you to communities, connect you to maybe other people at your institution who are doing open science or just know who are asking questions. There's lots of online resources as well, but often it's easier to just walk down to the library. That's great show. Mary, so I'll do a plus, yeah. plus 1000 for libraries <laughs> as being really, really amazing resources because their, their mission is connecting people with information in ways that are meaningful. Um, so that I'll also put in a plug for uh, NASA's Open Science 101, mm -hmm. 101, what better way to start um, to kind of get an introduction into these principles and kind of move your way deeper and deeper. Um, I also think I'm somebody who um, works really well in community. And so, you know, finding other people at your institution who may want to gather in the library, for example, um, to take that together and share these best practices. I found when I was an early career researcher that that finding, you know, that community and just sharing what we were learning as we were doing, you know, data management um, and, and sharing was just so incredibly helpful. Um, these informal communities of practice are just um, really wonderful. That's great. Anna, did you want to jump in? I mean, I haven't been in a research institution yeah. for a while now, so it's difficult. <laughs> but the uh, the feedbacks that we also receive is definitely the 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 librarians. I mean, they are supposed to be there, and they they are the ones who are like the first entry point to the open science world. But in those places where there is no information, because there are a lot of places where there still is no uh, other information, then there are places for those who are interested, reaching out even to UNESCO or to others who can then uh, kind of steer them towards some of the connections, uh, including some of the organizations who are participating uh, here today. Uh, I think it's uh, I think it's useful and definitely then creating a community of practice that that's the always the first uh, step. We've had some very interesting communities around hydrology, for example, and all stemming from just very young researchers who wanted to share their research and little by little created this community of hydrologists doing open science. So um, there is a lot of good examples there. There's a lot of good capacity building uh, modules uh, that that we can we can share. And I'm, I will be talking to Shell and see how we can disseminate even more broadly and maybe adapt a little bit the um, Open Science 101 that NASA produced that we can um, share it with, with other countries as well and other institutions um, too. Wonderful. 
Thank you all. Okay, one final question, and it's a little bit more specific, actually, I'm drilling back down, and, and it's for Miriam, and it's from Jenny Heimberg. Um, where might one find a list of the current federal repositories for open science? And, and then just a comment that it would also be interesting to see the trends over time on the number of repositories and their use. And I know that's a bit of a loaded question in some senses, but I, th I think the gist of it is federal repositories really supporting open science practices um, and demonstrating that. Um, so for a, for a list of um public access repositories for, uh, for publications, you can find those on, on science.gov um, as a really helpful resource. In terms of data, um, there's a whole, that system is a lot more um, diverse uh, and, and evolving. Um, I'll make a plug. Uh, this is in the biomedical research space, but um, NIH has a really nice list of um, data repositories that are that they support um, that are funded by um, by NIH. Um, and you can find those. I think if you look up like BMIC uh, data repositories, a list will come up. Um, some agencies have these kinds of lists of, of repositories that they um, that you know their researchers can use for data, um, but that is kind of kind of a mix. Data.gov is also a good resource for um, for some data resources. Uh, it's very very diverse landscape when it comes to to data sharing. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, some of some of these questions require a whole other event, right? And and we will get there. Um, thank you, Miriam. I'm going to pause here and give everyone at least a gift of one minute to um, certainly get another cup of coffee or caffeine or whatever uh, your beverage of choice is, and to tr to begin to transition to the next sessions. I want to first of all comment on the thoughtfulness of the questions. So thank you to all of the participants and audience members. The range of questions um, are wonderful to see because they reflect the program that we've also put together. So there's a lot of questions around infrastructure, community building, capacity building, rewards and incentives, and then really policy implementation. What does good implementation look like? And so the, I hope you enjoy the rest of the program and see and, and find um, some of the answers uh, potentially, or at least open up yet more questions for, for all of you to explore. Um, so definitely, I encourage you to, to continue to join those sessions. I also want to thank uh, Anna, Miriam, and Shell for their insights and reflections. It's certainly, I think, um, Anna, you, you summed it up beautifully in terms of many of these things happen during the year of open science, but they've also come before that, right? And so we are talking about a continuum here, and this is the point of this meeting as well, is to keep this excellent work going to forge stronger coalitions and to move forward together and learn from one another. So really grateful to all three of you for the thoughtfulness in your presentations and being available to answer um, the audience's questions. And with that, I will say that we will be posting the recording of this and all of the sessions um, after the event. We'll also be putting together a proceedings from uh, the event and some resources. A lot of a lot of resources will be shared throughout the event, but we'll try to organize those for folks as well. So, really grateful for your attention and time, and enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>